Hi, this is Bobby Collier, and today I wanted to continue our teaching series on identity in Christ, and this segment's going to be about faith, and our confession and our lifestyle needs to be like this. I am full of faith. I am steadfast in faith. I am immovable from faith. So if we want the promises of God to come true in our lives, then we must be full of faith. We must be locked in on the promises of God, believing in them in order for us to receive them. And we also need to lay hold of who we are in Christ and with Christ in us so that we can effectively help the people around us. Okay, so the Bible tells us and Jesus specifically tells us that we have a work to do. And the work that we have to do is that we need to believe in him whom the Father has sent. In other words, we need to believe in Jesus. We need to believe in his full salvation. And only when we do that will we be able to receive the fullness of what God has for us. So it's important for us to be strengthened in faith. And so what we're going to do over a three part series is we're going to teach on various faith topics. Okay, first of all, today we're going to see that victory over Satan comes by way of faith. We'll see that we must pray the prayer of faith in order to bring forth our Father's goodwill. Then we'll talk about um, how to perfect our faith. Okay, then in part two, we'll talk about eliminating ungodly inputs. You know, so a lot of us focus our attention on adding more Bible study, adding more testimonies, but we fail to remove things ungodly things ungodly inputs from our lives and therefore we're we're not fully optimized in faith because we still have contrary inputs that are warring against our believing in uh, in jesus okay then in part three we'll look at casting down and condemning ungodly thoughts and words and we'll also talk about thinking and speaking in agreement with the good will of god all right so those will be the faith topics and once we go through this, we'll see what we need to do to be strengthened in faith. We will become more effective immediately. Amen? Okay, so why are we making a big deal about faith? And the reason is because our victory over Satan and over the world, it comes by way of faith. Okay, so there's several key ingredients for victory over Satan. And just as a refresher, all the problems that we're having in life are the work of the devil. All curse that exists in the earth is the work of the devil. Death is the work of the devil. Sickness is the work of the devil. Poverty, chaos, strife, division, all the problems that you're having in life, those are all works of the devil. Okay, but we're entitled to a life of victory over the devil. Jesus came to this earth to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to this earth to give us life and life abundantly. Jesus came to this earth to give us a victorious life and to make us into brothers of his, to make us into sons of God. Okay, and so in order for any of these good things to happen, we must be established in faith. We must be established in believing in God and in his goodwill and in his promises. We need to believe in the works of Jesus and what they provide for us. Amen. Okay, so the key ingredients here are, first of all, we need to believe in Jesus and we need to be born again. Okay, if we have any desire to walk in victory in life, this is um, the primary ingredient, believing in Jesus. Okay, secondly, we need to be fully persuaded of Jesus' full salvation. Okay, Jesus didn't come to this, to this earth just so that we can um, believe in him and get to go to heaven when we die. Okay, that's, that's part of it. That's not all of it. All of it is he came to bring us sozo salvation in this present life, which will extend into the future life. He came to give us health and healing. He came to give us wholeness. He came to give us protection, provision, um, good welfare in life. Okay, so we need to lay hold of the full salvation of Jesus. We are entitled to a good life in this present life and good life forevermore, even after death. Amen? Okay, so um, another key ingredient for victory over Satan is that we need to be calm and composed, not fearful and emotional. Okay, when you're fearful and emotional, you are not in faith. When you are calm and composed, um, you can be calm and composed because in the middle of a crisis situation, you're trusting in God for the victory. So you are established in faith. However, if you're in the middle of a crisis situation and you're full of fear and you're emotional, then you're not trusting in God. Otherwise, you would be poised and confident. Okay, so we need to be calm and composed, which is a sign that we are in faith, that we are trusting in God. Okay, another key ingredient is that, you know, we have a role to play. 
everything's just not like automatic um, because we believe in Jesus. We have to we have to actively resist the devil. We have to resist the devil by operating in authority, and we have to resist the devil by not bowing down to his temptations. Okay, so we have a role to play. Okay, point E is we need to be immovable from the promises of God. And the Bible tells us that we can pray for anything according to our Father's goodwill, and He will hear us. And because we know that He hears us, we know that we will receive the thing that we have asked of Him. So we need to be established in the promises of God. We need to know His goodwill and believe in it. And then we'll have the opportunity for that to come true in our lives. Okay, and then point F is we need to lay hold of the aspect of our identity, which is related to authority, which is, you know, we have been made commanders. We have been made kings, rulers, reigners, sons of God. And we have to lay hold of this authoritative identity that we have and operate in that in order for victory to be continuous in our lives. Okay, so we go to 1 John 5, 4 to 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay, so this scripture is telling us how we're going to have victory in this present life. If we want victory, then we need to have faith. We need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to believe in the full salvation of Jesus. We need to be born of God to overcome the world. Okay, the, the way you become born of God is to believe in Jesus, confess him as your Lord, and then you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will be born again. The Spirit of God will be in you, dwelling with you forevermore. Okay, so we must be born of God. We must be become sons of God. Okay, so if you are a son of God, then you can overcome the world. You can overcome the world and all of the evil works that the devil has going on in this world. It says again, our victory of overcoming, it comes by way of faith, by way of believing in Jesus and in his full salvation. And then it says again, you know, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Okay, so our victory in this present life absolutely comes by way of believing in Jesus, by way of believing in his full salvation. If we do that, and if we learn how to operate in faith, then we will be victorious in this present life. Amen? If we go to 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Okay, so here... Well, first of all, he, he reveals to us the source of our problems in life is our adversary, the devil. Okay, so it's not God who's putting problems in our lives to frustrate us or to teach us or to punish us or anything like that. We have an adversary. It's the devil, the God of this world who is opposed to us, and he's seeking to destroy us, steal, kill, destroy. That's his mission in life, or at least one of the aspects of his mission. Okay, and it tells us that he is walking about like a roaring lion and he's actively seeking people to devour. Okay, so we we want to make sure that we're not those who are easily devourable. Okay, that means we need to do certain things. Okay, so first of all, he says be sober. So let's just look up a couple of words. And a lot of times when you look up definitions to words, you're going to have a much deeper understanding of what the passage is really talking about. Okay, so if we look up the word sober, be sober, be vigilant. What does sober mean? Sober is the Greek word nepho, and this means to be sober, to be calm and collected in spirit, to be temperate, to be dispassionate, and dispassionate means to be calm, to be composed, unflustered, unemotional, detached, cool. Okay, be circumspect. Okay, so if we're truly in faith, then we're going to be exhibiting the characteristic of being calm even in the midst of a crisis situation. And how can you be calm in a crisis situation? It's because you have learned the promises and the goodwill of God and you are believing it and you are trusting in him to deliver you from the situation. Okay, so if we are emotional, if we are flustered, 
if we are freaking out, if we are fearful, then we are not in faith. That's just the bottom line. Okay, so we need to be calm in a crisis situation. All the people around you who are not in faith, they will be fearful, they will be worrisome, they will be filled with anxiety, but don't let that get a hold of you. Okay, don't let fear get a hold of you. Be poised, be confident, be trusting in God. Amen? That's a necessary ingredient to have victory over the devil. Okay, then he goes on to say in, in verse 9 that we need to resist him. Okay, so we, when we're born again, we are made sons of God. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Christ uh, Jesus is the head of Christ. The believers are the body of Christ. And the entire Christ, which is Jesus the head, and me and you, the believers, the body, the entire Christ is seated in in heavenly places above all things, seated far above all principalities, powers, mights, dominions, seated far above every name that is named. Okay, so that's what it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1. We are seated in a place of authority above all of creation which is not in Christ. Okay, so we need to lay hold of our authority. We need to exercise authority by resisting the devil. And we'll look at how to resist him in just a minute here. Okay, but we have a responsibility to resist the devil by exerting authority against him and resist the devil by not bowing down to his temptations. Okay, so we resist him. Also, we need to be steadfast in faith. Okay, so let's just look at these two words, steadfast and, and also faith. So faith is the Greek word pistis, and this means persuasion, that is credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. Abstractly, constancy in such profession. By extension, the system of religious truth itself. Assurance, belief, believe, faith, fidelity. Okay, so faith is Faith is not just merely believing that Jesus is the Son of God. It's being fully persuaded about Him, being convinced that Jesus, He is the Son of God, being fully con convinced, being fully persuaded uh, in the full salvation of Jesus. Okay, salvation doesn't mean, is not limited to you get to go to heaven. Salvation is huge. Okay, so I encourage you study three words. Study the Hebrew word Yeshua. It's from the last verse of Psalm 91. Study the word sozo. Um, sozo is all throughout the New Testament. You can find it in like John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus came to sozo to save the world. Okay, so study that word. And then also study the, the Greek word soteria. You can find that in Romans chapter 10, I think verses 9 and 10 when he talks about um, confessing with the mouth unto salvation. Right? Okay, so you'll see those words. Yeshua in the Old Testament, Sozo and Soteria in the New Testament. Those three words are commonly translated as salvation. Those three words, the, the definitions of them will reveal to you the full salvation of Jesus. Okay, so it's not just you get your ticket punch and go to heaven. It's all about salvation throughout this present life and into the future after death. Amen? Okay, so we need to be fully persuaded about this full salvation, and we need to be constant in our profession, not wavering, not doubting. You know, for example, in the book of James, it tells that anyone who uh, is in faith, they're not going to be doubting. And anyone who's doubting, they're like a, a wave that's being um, driven and tossed by the wind, okay? And so somebody who's wavering in faith, somebody who's in and out of faith, who's not convinced of the promises of God, it says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Okay, so we need to be persuaded about the full salvation of Jesus, and we need to be constant in our profession of that full salvation. Okay, so one of the things we've been talking about in this identity in Christ teaching is we need to be confessing the word of God. And that includes we need to be confessing all the different aspects of the full salvation of Jesus. Again, study the three words, sozo, Yeshua, and soteria, and you'll, you'll see what that full salvation looks like. Okay, then the word uh, steadfast, it's the Hebrew word stereos, and that means to be strong, firm, immovable, solid, hard, rigid. Okay, so we need to be steadfast in faith. Okay, and this can be challenging at times because, for example, let's just say you pray for somebody who's on their deathbed. 
Well, you have all this contrary evidence saying they're going to die. You have the doctor saying they're going to die. Come say your, your last goodbyes. You have other family members who are wanting to call the, the priest in to give the last rites. You have machines beeping at you. You have breathing machines. You have life support. You know, all these things are going on. And this is like strong evidence, which is contradictory to you believing in this person being healed. Okay, well, we have to be strong and immovable from the promises of God. And if we can do that, we'll have the victory. The promise of God is, if you are a believer and you lay hands upon the sick, they will recover. That is a promise of God. It says that believers in his name will cast out demons. Okay, that is a promise of God. It is a promise of God that we have been given authority over the devil. Okay, so we need to exert our authority we need to exercise our faith and we need to not be moved from what we have prayed for on the basis of any contradictory evidence that presents itself because if we let the evidence move us then we have moved from faith and we will not receive the thing that we have prayed for okay so this is probably the most challenging aspect of being in faith is being steadfast immovable from the promises of god so we need to work on this amen all right, so I think this gives you a good idea. You know, our victory will come by being fully persuaded about the full salvation of Jesus, by being sober, calm, cool, collected in a crisis situation when facing the devil. Um, we'll need to exert authority. We'll need to resist him. We'll need to be immovable from faith despite contradictory evidence. Amen. And when we do this, we're going to have victory. Okay, so if we come to Luke 10, 19, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay, so Jesus gives believers authority over everything that the devil has. You know, serpents and scorpions are representations of evil. Um, it could be demons. It could be sickness. It could be poverty. It's just any evil thing. We have authority to trample down all evil. We have authority over all the power of the enemy. Okay, well, who's the enemy? The enemy is our adversary, the devil. Okay, we have authority over everything that the devil has. We have authority over all the power of the devil. Okay, so it's not some of the power. We have absolute supreme authority over the devil, over all of his workers, and over all of his works. Okay, so we need to just lay hold of this. We need to confess this. We need to believe this. We need to exert authority. And authority works by giving commands, by being authoritative, being bold, strong, and issuing commands in the name of Jesus. That's how authority works. And we looked at that in our last teaching, and we're going to look at it again today. Okay, and so we, we have authority over the devil. And if we can believe in Jesus, if we can believe in his words, you know, he promises us perfect protection. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. Nothing means nothing. That means no accident, no sickness, no calamity, no disaster, no war, no violence, no rioting. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So if you can believe in Jesus and you can be invincible, indestructible, unkillable, unsickable, uninjurable, unaccidentable, unharmable, unbeatable, uncrimable, unmurderable. Amen. Nothing means nothing. And just make a decision. I choose to believe in this. Okay. Faith begins with just making a decision. Choose to believe what God has said. You know, there's going to be all kinds of contradictory arguments against what Jesus has said. You know, you'll have people try and talk you out of this. Okay, just make a decision. Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you have given me authority over the devil and over all of his words. I believe that nothing shall by any means hurt you. So just make that decision. Okay, that's the starting point of faith is making the decision. Okay, now if we look at Luke 7, 8 to 9, we see how authority works and we'll see that Jesus likens an understanding and an operation in authority to having great faith. Okay, and so that's what we all need if we want victory in this life, if we want to overcome, if we want to abide in victory, we need to be great in faith. And Jesus says authority is a major ingredient of being great in faith. Okay, so in Luke chapter 7, 
For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Okay, so Jesus, he tells us what great faith is. Great faith is having an understanding of authority and then operating in it. And then we see here, how does, how authority works? Authority works by giving commands. Go, come, do this. Amen. So it's simple. The one who is in charge commands the one who is lesser and tells them what to do and they must obey. Okay, well, we are seated in heavenly places above all principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and every name that is named. So we are far above the devil and all of his kingdom, all of his workers, and all of his works. Okay, we are in a position of supreme authority, far above the devil and his kingdom. And so the way it works is, let's just say somebody has cancer. You're going to talk to, you're going to talk to Satan and you're going to talk to cancer. Satan, in the name of Jesus, you and your cancer, I command you get out of this person's liver. You leave right now. In the name of Jesus, liver, I command you be healed, function properly, liver values, be restored to normal, person, be filled with strength, be filled with life. Okay, so Authority is just command, command, command. You are in charge. You are a son of God. Jesus has made all of us who believe in him to be exactly like him. He has given us his spirit. He has given us his power. He has given us his authority. He has shared all these things with us, and we need to awaken to that, and we need to operate in that, and authority works by giving commands. So when we're going to resist the devil, we're going to resist him um, and one way is going to be by exerting authority, commanding the devil and his works to get out of your life, commanding his sickness to get out of your body or someone else's body, commanding his strife and marriage to depart from your household or your friend's household. Um, you know, so it's all going to be about you must exert your authority over the devil, resisting him, commanding him and believing it will be done, being immovable from the promise of God and you will be abiding in constant victory. Amen. So in the name of Jesus, let this be done. And every person listening to this video, let it be done that we lay hold of our authority. Let it be done that we are made steadfast and immovable in faith. Let it be done that we are poised, sober, and confident in every battle with the devil. And let it be done that we are the sons of God who continuously overcome all the works of the devil and all the evil in the world. And so be it for each of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we must pray the prayer of faith. Okay, I remember uh, years ago, I read in the book of James, and we'll just start here on verse 5, 14 to 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, so I remember reading that and I was like, man, what is this prayer of faith? I want to pray this prayer of faith. I want to pray and I want to heal the sick. I want to, I want to pray and my prayers are answered. What is this prayer of faith? Okay, so I didn't know what this prayer of faith was. Okay, but the prayer of faith is actually the mountain moving prayer. Like in Mark 11, 22 to 23 and Matthew 17 to 20 and in many other places in the gospel. You know, Jesus exemplifies this for us and teaches us what that prayer of faith is. Okay, so if we wanna be victorious, we must pray the prayer of faith. Okay, so praying the prayer of faith, that involves that we have to do a work. Okay, and Jesus tells us about this. There's a work which we must do, and our work, in order to do the works of God, our work is to believe in Jesus whom our Father has sent. Okay, we have a work to do, which is to establish ourselves in faith. 
Our work is to work on our believing in Jesus. We must work on our believing in his full salvation. Our work is to learn about all of his sufferings and the benefits it brings to us and believe in those things. Our work is to believe in the authority that has been given to us. Our work is to believe in the Holy Spirit and his power to help and to heal which has been given to us. So our work is to work on our believing in Jesus, our believing in authority, our believing in the Holy Spirit, our believing in the power of God given to us. That's the work that we must do. Okay, and when we do that work and establish ourselves in belief, then that's the beginning of walking in victory. Okay, apart from us being believing in him, we're not gonna have much victory. But when we get established in faith, in this full salvation, then victory is just, it's like clockwork. Amen? Okay, so that's point A. Point B is we need to pray by commanding. The prayer of faith works by commanding, by exerting authority. Okay, C is the prayer of faith works by believing that what we command will be done. Okay, and the prayer of faith works by, well, is finished up by receiving what we have spoken. Okay, so these are the ingredients for the prayer of faith. We need to believe in Jesus. We need to pray by commanding, which is an exertion of authority. And we need to believe that the thing that we have commanded will be done. And then we get the benefit. We receive what we have spoken. Okay, so we need to be aware of some things that hinder us. Okay, so first of all, you know, not believing in Jesus and his full salvation. That's, um, that's probably the number one thing. So not many people in church are taught about the full salvation of Jesus. Most are taught that, you know, they get to go to heaven when they die. If they're lucky, maybe they'll be healed. If it's God's will, maybe they'll be healed. You know, they really lack certainty in anything other than I get to go to heaven when I die. And that's very unfortunate because Jesus suffered many things to give us present life benefits. And just as eternal life salvation is available to anyone who believes in Jesus, in the same exact way, healing is available to anyone who will believe in him for that. Um, healing of the body and healing of the soul. Peace in life is available to us. Jesus was punished that we may have peace. So if we will believe in him for peace in life, we can be recipients of that. Okay, Jesus became poor that we are made rich. If we can believe in that, then we can have the benefit of prosperity in this life, having all of our needs always met with an abundance left over for every good work. Okay, that's the Bible definition of rich. Okay, so we need to believe in his full salvation. We need to we need to seek every reason to believe in God's goodness and his good, goodwill rather than listening to all the arguments of people who are not in faith, um, even in the church, who are speaking against um, the promises of God. Okay, what hinders us? Praying in the wrong way. Okay, your average Christian, they're like requesting and begging God. Oh God, please heal me. Please take this pain away. Please, if it's your will, take this cancer out of my body. Please, please, please. And that doesn't do anything. That, that is not the instruction that Jesus gave us. Jesus gave us different instructions and it's very simple. And we're going to look at it again. We saw it in our last teaching and we'll see it again today. Okay, what else hinders us? Okay, doubting and wavering. Okay, so many of us may have learned the promises of God. We may recognize that Jesus paid for our healing. We may believe that when we lay our hands upon the sick, they will recover. But then sometimes things will happen that can cause us to question it. You know, it could be that you pray for somebody for healing and then all of a sudden things get worse. So now you have this contradictory evidence. And so one of our challenges is we have to, we have to, fight the temptation to bow down to that contrary evidence. Okay, so if we bow down to it, then we're wavering, we're doubting, okay? Uh, another thing that hinders us is being timid instead of being bold. When the Bible tells us how Jesus prayed, it says, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Okay, he wasn't meek and mild and quiet. It says he rebuked the fever. You know, he rebuked the demon. Okay, a rebuke is a sharp reprimand. So when Jesus was dealing with a problem, he rebuked the wind and the waves. You know, he was, he was dealing with things in a sharp, bold, authoritative manner. He was not meek and mild. He was not asking Father, oh, Father, please stop the, the wind. Please help us. You know, it wasn't like that. 
Okay, but that's how many Christians pray is they're, they're begging and pleading and they're not having certainty about what they're asking for. Okay, we need to be bold and strong. We need to pray by commanding, in authority, unwavering, with boldness. Amen? Well, what else hinders us? Okay, human, normal, natural human thinking hinders us. You know, if we're looking at science and medicine to understand why a person's sick, then we're going to be focused in on germs. You know, that, that, that germ, the problem is they were on the airplane and they're sitting next to this person and they coughed on them and, and they had a cold and the, the virus got in them and they got sick. And so what happens with that kind of thinking is, you know, your attention is completely removed from the devil. The devil is the source of sickness. Forget about virus. Forget about germ. The devil is the cause of sickness. Resist the devil and he will flee. Okay, we need to focus our attention on spiritual matters. We do not war against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness. We're, we're dealing with spiritual issues. Okay, so somebody gets sick because Satan has attacked them. In Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with them. So Jesus was healing those who were oppressed by the devil. If somebody has a healing need, it is because they are oppressed by the devil. Okay, so we need not be science and medicine minded, be spiritual minded. Okay, you're trying to get the devil out of somebody's body. Forget about the germ, forget about the virus. It's the devil is your enemy. Amen? And in fact, if you believe in Jesus, you can lay your hands upon all those sick people with all those germs and all those viruses and never get sick. I have laid hands on thousands of people and I've never gotten sick from doing it. I went to the hospital yesterday and touched a bunch of sick people. I never once have gotten sick from doing it. You know, if you believe in Jesus, then you are immune to sickness if you will believe. You can touch all the sick people you want and you will never get sick. Amen? Okay, we, that is what we are entitled to. Okay, somebody who is rational minded, they're going to be extremely weak in faith. Somebody who's realistic minded will be extremely weak in faith. Okay, so this whole this whole concept of of God, it's it's a miraculous thing. It's supernatural. If all you can believe is something that's realistic, you know, then you're not established in faith. You're just thinking like a normal human being. It's unrealistic to think that I can lay my hands on this person who's about to die and then expect them to live. Okay, that is unrealistic. That is irrational. Okay, if you're rational minded, then you're not going to see miracles happen. A miracle is irrational. An, a miracle is unrealistic. As long as you're focused on what's realistic, you're not in faith. You're just going to receive what ordinary people in the ordinary world can receive. Okay, so you got to just just remove rational and realistic thinking. Let it be pruned from you. You know, ask your father to prune you from this human limited thinking. Because as long as we have human limited thinking, then we're not going to believe in the supernatural. We're not going to believe in healing. We're not going to believe in miracles. We're not going to believe we're going to be helpless. Amen. Okay, believing in God, it's irrational. And it's unrealistic. And that's the way we need to be. We need to believe in the impossible by believing in Jesus and believing that all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible with God. That's the kind of thinking that we need to have. All right. Um, then what else hinders us? Lack of practice and lack of past victories to draw upon. Okay, so many people, they like study, 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 and they're learning about the promises of God, but they just aren't putting it into practice. Okay, so don't wait until somebody that you love is on their deathbed, and then all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, try and pray for somebody in faith to get them healed. You need to be continuously practicing your faith, putting into practice. This is a faith life. And so every day of your life, you should be speaking to mountains, speaking to situations, exercising authority every day of your life. We are sons of God and we are to operate in faith continuously. It's not just a one-time thing when a crisis happens. Every day you need to speak to your situations that you're facing. Every day speak to your situations at work and tell them what to do in the name of Jesus. Speak to the situations in your home life and tell them what to do in the name of Jesus. Every day continuously we should be operating in faith speaking our faith to all the things that we're facing and the things that people around us are facing 
facing facing okay so we need to continuously put in practice our faith and and when i say practice faith i i mean practice it like i've prayed for just silly stuff so for example i have i have cats and i have like I have prayed for cat box odor to leave in the name of Jesus. And I was, you know, I would just sit there and I was talking to it. In the name of Jesus, cat box odor smell, I command you to leave in Jesus' name. And then nothing happened and I did it again. And nothing happened and I did it again, bolder, stronger. And boom, the smell left. Okay, so it's of no consequence, right? It's not a life and death matter, but I'm practicing my faith. I've prayed for honeybees. You know, I found... A honeybee in the water bowl that the cats drink out of in the backyard. He broke his wing off because he got stuck in the water and he was fighting, trying to get out. And so I prayed for him and his his wing got restored. And then it happened again later in the week with another bee. He broke his wing off and I prayed for him and boom, his wing got restored. And, um, and then one drowned in the water bowl and I prayed for him for two and a half hours and then he was restored to life. Okay, so I was practicing my faith. Be practicing your faith continuously. And then when a crisis situation comes along that really matters, like somebody you love is, is sick and, and facing death, you're going to be stronger. You're going to be more poised, more confident if that situation ever arises, if you have been practicing and seen many victories. Okay, so your past victories will help you be victorious in the future situations that you will face. And so one of the things I encourage you to do is to keep a log of all your answer prayers. Keep a log of your healing victories. Keep a log of your financial victories. Keep a log of all your answered prayers. And then when some big thing comes up, you know, you can reflect back on those past victories and be strengthened for the present moment. And if you look at King David, you know, there's a type and shadow of that. You know, uh, God was with me with the lion. God was with me with the bear. God will be with me with this giant. Okay, when he was facing Goliath. Okay, so he was reflecting upon past victories, you know, from a lesser thing to a greater thing to the greatest thing which that he was facing, which was the giant. In the same way, reflect on your past victories and draw strength from that and then pray in faith for the present situation that you're facing. All right. If we look at John 6, 28 to 29, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Okay, so we have, if we want to do the works of God. Okay, so for example, the works of God, um, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, setting people free from oppression of the devil, supernaturally fulfilling the needs of the people. Those would be examples of some of the works of God, which Jesus was continuously doing. Okay, if we want to do those works, then our work is this. Our work is to believe in Jesus whom the Father has sent. That is our work. Okay, and so that's what this teaching series is about, is we want to see what do we need to do to increase our believing in Jesus whom Father has sent. We need to believe in that full salvation. Amen? Okay, now let's just look at Mark eleven twenty two 22, and 23. And this is the prayer of faith. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Okay, so the first ingredient is we need to have faith in God. We need to believe in the full salvation of Jesus. We need to know what Jesus has paid for and entitled us to. So we need to have faith in God. Okay, then he says, whoever... Okay, so this isn't limited to pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists. This is me and you. This is ordinary believers in Jesus. Whoever says to the mountain. So we're going to speak not to God. We're going to speak directly to the problem. The mountain represents the problem. We're going to have faith in God. We're going to know his goodwill and his promises. Then we're going to exert our authority. We're going to speak to the mountain. We're going to speak to the problem that we are facing. We're going to give it a command, be removed, be cast into the sea. So we're going to boldly and authoritatively command the problem that we're facing. We're going to tell it what to do. 
we're going to command the, the evil to leave. We're going to command the devil to leave. We're going to command financial difficulty to leave. We're going to speak directly to the problem, command what we don't want to leave. And then we're going to command what we do want to come. Okay, let's just say you can't pay your bills. In the name of Jesus, Satan, I command you, get off of my finances. Okay, so you command the devil to get off of your finances. Then command what you do want. In the name of Jesus, finances be blessed and be prosperous. In the name of Jesus, bills be paid. All financial obligations be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus, so be it. Okay, so I have just spoken to the mountain. I have just commanded the mountain to do something. I commanded the evil to leave and I commanded the solution to come. Okay, that's just simply operating in authority. You are a commander. You are a son of God. Okay, you, you simply just speak to your problem and you tell it what to do. Remember Jesus, he made us kings and priests. What does a king do? A king issues commands. A king issues declarations, proclamations, decrees. A king is constantly giving commands and the, the command of the king, it must be carried out. Amen? You are a king. Jesus died and made you king. Jesus is the king of kings. You are a king in the kingdom of Jesus. You are a king who has been given supreme authority over all creation. You are seated in heavenly in heavenly places above all principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and every name that is named. You are a king in a position of authority, and whatever you, the king, commands, it shall be done. Amen? So we need to know the good will of God. We need to command the evil works to leave. We need to command the good will, good will of God to be done in the situation. The good will of God is, and my God shall supply all of your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? So the person facing a financial situation needs to believe in that scripture from Philippians 4.19. You need to believe in that, and then you need to um, speak to your situation, commanding the bills to be paid or whatever other need is to be fulfilled. Amen? And it will be done. Okay? So if you believe the things that you say will be done because you know and believe the good promises of God, then you will have whatever you say. This is the prayer of faith. This is the prayer of faith which will heal the sick. This is the prayer of faith which will bring forth an answer to a financial problem. This is the prayer of faith which will get a devil out of a marriage so that the couple can be reconciled. This is that prayer of faith. Amen? Okay, now let's stretch our imagination. John 14, 12 to 13. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay, so Jesus said, anyone who believes in him, that we will do the same works that he did. Okay, well, what were the works he was doing? He was preaching and teaching. He was constantly healing the sick, casting out demons raising the dead. He was setting people free from oppression of the devil. He was supernaturally multiplying the food, fulfilling the needs of the people. Okay. And many other things he did. Okay. But the core things the, the most important things of all that Jesus did. And, and when you see it, you'll see these two things together more than anything else, preaching and teaching and healing, preaching, teaching and healing constantly. Okay. So a number one work of the devil is sickness, disease, injury, physical suffering and soul suffering. Okay, so we constantly need to be doing the same things that Jesus was doing, preaching the good news, preaching about dominion, authority, the kingdom of God, and demonstrating it by setting people free from sickness, by healing the sick. That's the primary thing that Jesus was doing. And likewise, that should be one of the primary things that we are doing. Okay, now it, Jesus even said that we would do greater works than what he did. Okay, so just engage your imagination and just read the gospels. And when it says, and Jesus did some great miracle and Jesus healed them all, just stop for a minute and have a daydream and just envision yourself doing the same thing. Envision yourself at the hospital, healing the sick, envision yourself 
when there's a car crash on the street and you run over them uh, over to them and you lay hands on them and you heal them and they jump up off the ground healed okay engage your imagination and daydream about these things daydream about the works of jesus and so you want to stretch your imagination you want to lose this rational and realistic thinking and you want to have this big godly all things are possible imagination you want to have this i can do the works of jesus imagination you want to have this mindset i can do greater things than jesus he told me so okay so engage your imagination engage your daydreaming and begin seeing yourself doing the works of jesus amen okay and then he says and whatever you ask in my name that i will do okay we looked at this word ask last time we met and this is the word i tell and ask doesn't simply mean make a request in the form of a question. Okay, that's that's not the only form of asking. This word ask means to claim, require, demand. Okay, I demand this person to be healed. Okay, and that means you're going to command it. You're going to demand it. You're going to require. You're going to require the devil to get out of their body. You're going to require and demand cancer get out of this body in the name of Jesus. Okay, that's the kind of asking that we're talking about. That's the kind of asking that Jesus exemplified in Mark 11:22 and 23. That's the kind of asking that Jesus exemplified in, in Matthew 17:20. It wasn't asking a question. Ask. It was a commanding, demanding, requiring form of asking. This word ask, I tell you, it means to uh, call for. And that word call for means to speak in a loud, distinct voice so as to be heard at a distance. Okay, and remember, it says, uh, it says at times Jesus prayed in this manner, such as when he called Lazarus forth in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Okay, so it says that a couple times in the Gospels. Okay, so when we're, when we're I tell you, we are calling for, we are demanding, we are requiring, we are commanding. Okay, so this isn't making a request kind of asking. This is commanding, demanding, calling for kind of asking. And when we do that, then we'll be doing the works of Jesus. Then we'll be doing greater works. Okay, as long as we're sitting there making requests of God, nothing miraculous is going to happen. Okay, it's going to be unlikely. It can happen, but it's not guaranteed. But if you will operate commanding, demanding, operating in authority, operating as Jesus specifically instructed us in these two passages, then you're going to see mighty things happen. All right. Then again, in Matthew 17, 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, so if nothing is impossible for you, that is completely irrational and unrealistic. Okay, so if you want miraculous things to happen, you have to be believing in the impossible. You have to lose this rational, realistic thinking. Okay, it's unbelief. You know, rational, realistic thinking, medicine-mindedness, um, science-mindedness, that's going to result in unbelief. Because you're, you're going to find a hard time believing beyond what science says. If you can't believe beyond what science says, you'll never see a miracle. That's the bottom line. Okay, so unbelief will hinder you. Believing, you know, being limited to what science, medicine, and rational thinking tell you will limit you. It will hinder you. You will have unbelief and you will not be fruitful. Okay, but all we need is faith as a mustard seed. And what do you do with the seed? You plant it. You plant that seed by speaking to the mountain. Okay, so there'll be times when you pray and command and things will happen, boom, instantaneously. Other times it will be as if you planted a seed and it takes time for it to grow before the plant comes forth, before the answer comes forth. Okay, so you're going to experience a combination of these. The key thing is keep believing. Don't be moved away from the promise of God. Every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen in Christ. Okay, that's what it tells us in Corinthians. We know from 1 John 5, 14 and 15 that we can expect that when we pray for God's good will to be done, it will be done. Okay, so don't be moved if you don't see something happen instantaneously. You will see many things happen instantaneously, but you will also have many things that will take some amount of time for them to come, come to pass. Even Jesus himself, you know, he prayed for the 10 lepers. And then as they went, you know, after they were out of his sight, you know, somewhere on their road, uh, on the way down the road, somewhere down the road, they were healed. And then one of them came back. 
Okay, and, and Jesus said, well, weren't, weren't all 10 of you healed? You know, how come only one of you has come back to give thanks? Okay, so his expectation, even though he didn't see it happen before his eyes, his expectation was that all 10 of them were healed, even though nothing happened before his eyes. Okay, and so in the same way that Jesus did not move away from the promise because it, he didn't see it happen immediately, he continued to believe. He was steadfast in faith. He was immovable from the promises of God. Okay, and so therefore the people were healed. Okay, so we have to work on this. Amen? All right, so what's going to help us with this? How do we perfect our faith? Okay, so I have seven things list, listed here. So number one is we need New Covenant Bible reading and we need New Covenant Bible study from teachers who produce good fruit. Okay, so studying the law and curses is going to greatly hinder you. There's no reason to study that. You are redeemed from law and you are redeemed from curse. There's absolutely no reason to study that. Okay, we need to listen to what Jesus said. What did Jesus say was important from the Old Testament? Okay, when, when asked what was the greatest command of all, he said, you know, loving God and loving your neighbor. He said, that is the greatest command. He said, all the law and all the prophets hangs upon those two things, loving God and loving your neighbor. Okay, that's what's important from the Old Testament law. Just simply that, and only that. Love God, love your neighbor. End of story. Okay, what else is important? Jesus said that prophecy of himself was important. He said, you search the scriptures and you think you find, find life, but they are that which testifies of me. So it's not all of that, that volumes of information in the Old Testament, only a portion of that is, is good and necessary for you. And it's that portion which is about loving God and loving your neighbor. It's that portion which is prophecy of Jesus and all the redemptive works that he would do. And, and also he said, um, prophecy of salvation. So knowledge of salvation is an important thing from the Old Testament. Okay, so it's very simple. Those three things, um, loving God and your neighbor, prophecy of, of Jesus, and prophecy of salvation. Those are the three things we need to know from the Old Testament. And then just resolutely focus your attention on the new covenant. You are a new covenant person. Law and curse have nothing to do with you. Don't study it. Study Jesus. Study what he has done for you. Believe in what he has done for you. Study salvation, full salvation. Believe in that. That's what you need to study. Study the promises of God. Believe in that. That's what you need to know. Amen? Okay, and then you shouldn't be just listening to any old teacher that you find on you know, on TV or whatever. You, you need to specifically listen to teachers who produce good fruit. And I'm going to give you some suggestions in a minute. Uh, on the next page. But, you know, Jesus said, if I don't do the works of God, then don't believe me. He said, only believe me if I do do the works of God. If I do perform miracles, then believe me. If I don't perform miracles, you have no reason to believe me. Okay? And so Jesus was very clear about that. In the same way, if, if somebody who's supposedly a man of God can't produce a miracle, um, then there's no reason for us to believe what they're saying. You know, the gospel is a gospel of power, of healing, of deliverance, of freedom from oppression of the devil. Without the power of God, it's a worthless gospel. Okay, so anybody who's preaching the gospel, they need to be active in setting people free, just as Jesus was. Now, I'm not saying that we've been perfect like Jesus was in healing the sick, but there should be some good demonstration of healing, of devil casting, of, of helping people, of continuously answered prayers. There should be good fruit in order for you to listen to what a particular teacher is telling you. Okay, secondly, you'll be perfected in faith by just consuming volumes of testimonies. Testimonies will make the Word of God come true. Um, testimonies will make it come alive. Testimonies will take that 2,000-year-old scripture and it will show you that it's true even today. So testimonies are extremely powerful. And I'm going to give you some suggestions on testimony videos and books. Okay, also testimonies of just replaying your own victories in your mind. Um, retelling your victories to other people. You know, anytime you're focused on reading, watching, or just consuming or speaking victories from God, then you're going to be strengthened in faith and all the people around you are going to be strengthened in faith. Okay, we also need to have godly conversations. Okay, we have too many people in our lives that 
you know, don't believe in God and they think we're foolish for believing in healing or believing in this or whatever. Okay, those are ungodly conversations and things that we need to eliminate from our life. But we, didn't, we do need to increase in godly conversations and talking to people who are sharing their victory stories with us and we share our stories with them. And when we do that, we're both going to be strengthened. Okay, the third thing we need to do to be perfected in faith is we must continuously be exercising our faith. We must put faith in practice every single day. Be speaking to your mountains. Be speaking to little things. Be speaking to big things. Be speaking to your mountains continuously. And, and do it for yourself, for your own life, and also the people around you. Exert your faith continuously. And then you're going to have a multitude of victories to draw upon when a bigger situation comes. And you're going to be stronger. You're going to be prepared. Your faith is going to have been exercised. And faith is, you know, think of it like a muscle. You know, the more you exercise your muscles, the stronger they are. Okay, in the same way, the more you exercise your faith, the stronger it is, the more effective it is, the more confident you'll be in a situation. Okay, so don't wait for some life and death thing to happen um, before you exert faith. And so like if I get a pain in my little pinky finger, I'm going to command that pain to leave in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to let it grow into a bigger thing. So exert your authority and your faith over even tiny little things. Okay, number four. So we're going to spend some significant time talking about this in the next teaching is it's not good enough to do number one and number two. It's not good enough to increase godly inputs. It is absolutely necessary if you want to be perfected in faith that we must eliminate ungodly inputs and we need to replay only victories and we need to not be replaying our failures. Okay, so we need to eliminate you know, there's people in our lives that need to be cut out of our lives. There are people that, you know, they may call you superstitious or like I had a family member tell me that um, I don't believe in your superstition of healing. And, and basically, they're just a fountain of unbelief. You know, if you're talking to this person, it's a fountain of unbelief. And it's just a faith killer. A faith destroyer is not, a, it's not helping your faith. People like that, you got to cut them out of your life. Or you need to control or minimize conversation with them. Okay, that is a necessity. Okay, number five, we also need to learn this technique of casting down and condemning ungodly thoughts and words. Okay, so let's just say you pray for somebody and you're believing they're going to be healed. And then the doctor comes back and says, oh, we run a new lab report and their brain is in worse shape than it was before. And they're surely going to die. We need to send them to hospice care. Okay, I've had this happen many times. Okay, and you have to cast that down. You can't accept what the doctor says. You know, God said he will make this world's wisdom foolish. So we can believe in God, then he'll make that doctor look foolish. So we need to be believing in God. We need to cast down those words of death of the of the devil coming through the doctor. You cast those those words down and you reject them. You know, otherwise you're going to get what the doctor says, and you don't want that unless he's saying good news. All right. So it's important. We have to learn to cast down everything that contradicts the promises of God that we're believing in. Okay. Number six is we need to think and speak single mindedly in agreement with the goodwill of God. Okay. We can't we can't pray for someone who's sick on their deathbed of cancer and then, um, uh, you know, an hour later be talking to the priest and planning funeral songs. I, I've seen that happen. And guess what? The person died because there was not faith present. You know, you can't on the one hand pray for somebody to live and then on the other hand be making, be planning funeral songs with the priest. You can't do that. You're not in faith for healing if you're making arrangements for funeral. It's one or the other. So we need to be single-minded. We need to agree with what, with the good will of God. We need to single-mindedly lock in on the thing that we prayed for and not waver from that. Okay, so that's going to be very important. And then number seven, we also need to just pray and ask our Father to prune us and make us more fruitful. You know, Jesus said that he is the vine, we are the branches, and our Father is the vine dresser, and that he will prune us and make us more fruitful. So I'm continuously praying and asking God to prune me and make me more fruitful. So likewise, be praying, asking your Father to prune you. All right, so these are the things that we're going to be looking at in this teaching series. So I wanted to give you some teaching suggestions. Um, so first of all... Um, Many of you are watching this on YouTube right now, but there are others apart from YouTube who'll see this. And I just want you to know that I have many teachings 
uh, on YouTube. Uh, I'm Bobby Collier of Dominion Bible Ministries, and there are many, many teachings that will establish you in faith, especially in authority and healing and the goodwill of God. And so you can find those teachings at this site here. Okay, then Andrew Womack. I think Andrew Womack is very good at establishing you in the promises of God to experience them in your own life. Okay, and I think that Curry Blake is very good at establishing you in faith to help other people. So I view Andrew makes you strong for yourself, and I view Curry makes you strong to help other people. Um, and, and just because I recommend people, that doesn't mean I agree with 100% of what they say, but they have been foundational in establishing me in faith. Okay, and likewise, they will be the same for you. So from Andrew, he's got a couple of, of really good teachings. He's got probably hundreds of teachings, but here are a few key ones. You know, God wants you well. So that was the first teaching that I ever listened to on the subject of healing. And it just blew me away when I saw um, the truth about healing. When I saw that Satan was responsible for sickness. When I saw that Jesus paid for us to be healed. When I saw that we had been given authority and power over the devil and over sickness. When I saw that we had to pray differently by commanding. Okay, all those things I learned in this four-hour teaching, God wants you well. And it's, it was a huge game changer for me. You know, how to receive God's best. So he talks about if we want to receive the benefits of God, how are we going to do that? So he, he talks about that in this teaching. Then another just phenomenal teaching was the power of faith-filled words. This is about a five-hour teaching, and he talks a lot about the power of our words. You know, the power of death and life is contained in our words. The power, God's power can be in our words, or Satan's power can be in our words. You know, so every time you speak, you're releasing either the power of God or the power of the devil. And so we need to make sure that we're speaking carefully, such as every word that we speak will come true. And and so anyway, this teaching will help you um, in a huge way. Okay, then Curry Blake, he has the most profound healing ministry on earth today. He's had you know tens and tens and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of healings in his ministry, both personally and through the people that he's taught. And I, you know, I'm a student of Curry Blake, I'm a student of Andrew Womack, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of healings in, in the last five years since I learned these things. He has a teaching series called Divine Healing Technician Training. You can buy that or you can watch it free on YouTube. He has another one called, um, it's called New Man, and this is about your identity in Christ. And there's a partial teaching here. You can also go to his website, uh, jglm.org, and go to the store and you can buy the complete version. Okay, so these teachings were just phenomenal, and they helped to establish me in faith to help other people especially. Okay, Barry Bennett. Um, you can go to YouTube and search for Barry Bennett eight-part healing teaching. So he has an eight-hour class that he taught for Karis Bible College, which is Andrew Womack's Bible College. And so what I did in the beginning is I, I took this four-hour free teaching, God Wants You Well, and then I took this eight-hour teaching from Barry Bennett, I watched 20 testimony videos, and then I was able to um, he heal myself from damage that I had in the neck, back, and shoulder. And then I was also able to pray for my mother-in-law, whom I'd been praying for for one year. She had had a stroke. And for one year, I had been praying for her continuously, and nothing happened. And then after learning truth from 12 hours of teaching from Barry Bennett and Andrew Womack, 12 hours of teaching... 20 little testimony videos, and I went and prayed for her, and boom, one prayer, and she was healed. So it's just amazing. Okay, when you learn the truth and believe the truth and exercise authority, you know, the prayer of faith, then you're going to see fruit happen. Okay, then um, Kenneth Hagin. Um, so he's got a lot of little books that I like to read. You know, he had one called The Bible Healing Study Course, um, this little book on words. A lot of these books are like one to two dollars. Like words is probably two dollars, you know, on Amazon.com. Um, you can have what you say, prayer secrets, knowing what belongs to it, faith takes back what the devil stolen. So he has a lot of good little booklets, which I find very, um, they, they just strengthen me in faith. They make me believe that when I exert my authority, when I speak my faith, I, it will be done. You know, so I get a lot of confidence from his little booklets. I would say he probably has the least accurate doctrine of some of the people I mentioned, but he's very faith invoking. Okay, so I just focus on being established in faith. That expectancy of when you pray it will be done. You can get that from Kenneth. Okay, then some testimony suggestions. 
Andrew Womack has about 25 healing testimony videos at this site. He's got 10 or 15 financial testimony stories. Most of these stories are probably 10 or 15 minutes long, so you can watch a couple of them before you go pray for somebody, and you're going to be stronger in faith. You're going to be more likely to be believing when you pray for the person if you take in a video right before you minister. So that's a good thing to do. Okay, then there's some books I recommend. You know, it's good to have a steady diet of miracle stories every day, and so I tend to do that. Um, probably four or five times a week, you know, I'm reading miracle stories on, you know, every day, multiple times during the day, just consuming these stories. And some are more miraculous than others. But nonetheless, these books will establish you with an expectancy that God's going to do things in your life and when you pray. So Miracles, a 52-week devotional by Karen Kingsbury is a good one. Um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Miracles Happen. And they, ha they have many other books. So this is just one of many on the subject of miracles. Then um, one I'm reading right now, it's called Mysterious Ways, True Stories of the Miraculous. There's a lot of good stories of God's deliverance and protection uh, in this book, and I'm about halfway through right now. Then if you want to see how to minister to people, you can um, watch people like Todd White, Pete Cabrera, Torben Sundergaard, and they have videos where they've, you know, they've been filmed ministering to people in public, so you can see how they approach people, how they pray for them. You'll see miracles happen. You'll see legs legs grow. You'll see pains disappear, um, hearing restored, blindness healed. You'll see a, a lot of things like that when you watch their videos. And for example, for me, after I'd done all this studying through Curry Blake, learning how I can help other people and pray for the sick and expect them to be healed, what I was lacking was a boldness and a confidence to actually go up to strangers and minister to them. And so I watched a couple hours of Todd White on a Friday night. And then the next day on Saturday, I, I just felt more confident that I could actually do this. I saw how poised and confident he was in walking up to people in public and approaching them and asking to pray for them. And so I drew a lot of confidence and boldness from watching Todd White. And then that, that very next day on that Saturday, I saw my first miracle happen in the grocery store, um, Kroger's grocery store. And uh, what happened was I had gone to the mall and I was looking for somebody to pray for earlier in the day on Saturday and I was chicken. I probably walked past five different people and I was too scared to walk up to them and pray for them. So then later that night, I went to the grocery store and there was a guy, it was late at night, you know, so I made sure I went late at night because I didn't want to encounter anybody and have to pray for them because I was feeling ashamed about not praying for the people earlier in the day. So sure enough, I get out of my truck and there's somebody hobbling across the parking lot, limping. And I'm like, oh no, here we go again. And so I walk past him and then I'm like, no, I am going to do this. And so I turn around and I walk back up to him as he was getting in his car and I asked him, I said, can I pray for you? And then I, I quickly just prayed for his knee and then I, I left and went inside the Kroger's grocery store. Okay, so I had kind of had a little breakthrough and then I approached a stranger. And then after that, I'm like, okay, definitely I'm safe now. I'm not going to have to pray for anybody, <laughs> you know, because I was, I was nervous about all this. So I go in, I'm on the cake aisle and sure enough, another person comes limping down the aisle. It was this little lady that works there. And, you know, but this time a boldness came on me. I'm like, I got this. And so she's limping down my aisle and I'm like, what's the matter? And she's like, I hurt my knee about a month ago. Okay, so she had an injured knee and she's had this injury for a month. She's had the pain for a month. And so I asked her if I could pray for her and I prayed for her. And, and then, you know, I, I just said, you know, in the name of Jesus, I command pain and injury. You leave this knee, you leave right now. In the name of Jesus knee, I command you be healed, be filled with comfort, function properly, no more pain. All bending, twisting, running, jumping, be restored right now. In the name of Jesus, so be it. So it's just real simple like that. And then I told her, I said, okay, I want you to bend down. And she bent down and or squatted down and her knee didn't hurt. And I asked her to extend her leg and she was doing all these things and the, the pain was completely gone. And she was so excited and she was hugging me and she was calling people on the phone right here in the middle of the grocery store in the middle of the night. She's making phone calls, calling people, telling them that God did a miracle and healed her knee. And I was just overwhelmed with joy. Okay. And so... Uh, all that came about because I drew confidence from watching testimonies, from watching Todd White um, minister to people in public. 
Okay, so it'll strengthen you in faith and it will also give you technique. It'll give you poise. It'll give you confidence to approach people. Amen? All right. So then I'm going to wrap things up for today. These are just a list of confession scriptures that I do on the topic of faith on a weekly basis. Um, so you can just take a screenshot. I'm not going to go through all these right now, but I would just make a confession out of them. I'll just exemplify one. You know, Acts 6 eight. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Okay, so the thing about Scripture is we want to believe it and we want to speak it. And whatever you believe and whatever you speak out of your mouth, it will come true. Okay, that's the law of faith. And so we want to continuously be confessing Scripture over our lives. So I'll do something like this. And Bobby, full of faith. And Bobby is full of the Holy Spirit. Bobby is full of the power of God. And Bobby does great wonders. And Bobby does great signs among the people. Bobby heals the sick. He raises the dead. He casts out demons. Okay, so I'll do it like in, uh, I'll put my name in there. Okay, then I'll do it first person. I am full of faith. I am full of the Holy Spirit and I am full of the life-giving power of God. I am full of the healing power of God. I am full of the devil-casting, dead-raising power of God. I am full of it because I am full of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I do great wonders and I do great signs among the people. I heal the sick. I heal them all. I raise the dead. I raise them all. I cast out every unclean spirit. Amen? Okay, so I will do something like that. So I'm going to be taking these scriptures, I'm going to be confessing them, I'm going to put my name in there, I'm going to create scenarios with them, I'm going to speak them out, and then these things will come true in your life. Okay, so confession is an important part of, of strengthening in faith. Alright, so that's all for now, so God bless you, and I will talk to you again soon.